Good morning. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my Facebook stuff set up the way I need it so I can see what you guys are asking. <clears throat> good morning, good morning. The wind is not blowing here, which is pretty rare sight. Or it's not blowing yet. Let's put it that way. Oh, okay, you guys. I'm ready. I'm ready if you are. Let me get my stuff on without the bank because somebody usually comments on there. That's somebody being a Mr. Michael. Let me. How's it going today? Talk to me. Talk to me. Hey, Brent. Being a Mr. Michael. Okay, there we go. Minnesota, why can't I see your comments? Morning from Minnesota, something I can't see it. I don't know why. I talked to somebody over there yesterday and they actually said it was pretty nice. Oh, morning from Minnesota, Mary Jo. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good morning, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> Michigan. Not often do I see people from Michigan. Oh, it's July 1st today. <laughs> I did not know that. Okay, for those of you that didn't know, I'll, you know, a few of you that are watching, three the way it looks. I have a birthday on the 15th, and I love my birthday, and so time to count down. Oh, love my birthday. <laughs> it's my favorite. I used to celebrate, like I used to do like a 30 day countdown, literally. <laughs> and then I had my daughter whose birthday was just last week. And so I have, I have to, I only have like 15 days now. We have to celebrate her. <laughs> I have to be, I have to be less um, important, I guess you could say. All right, let's talk about what happened in the last two weeks. Oh goodness. Um, I am not sure. I am not sure um, when I was on here last. Your birthday is the fourth. Well, that's just a couple days away. Happy early birthday. A day to celebrate. You know, that, as a child, that probably was not a good day to have a birthday. Because <laughs> nobody is home. Everybody's gone. You cannot have your birthday parties because everybody's gone. Not that we really got to have birthday parties when we were growing up. We didn't. So it really didn't matter when it was, but... July was always just a really, like, even though mine's the 15th, it was still a bad time to have a birthday because people are busy and they forgot. And I assumed they forgot because they were busy. <laughs> Maybe just my parents were busy and they just didn't have time for such luxuries. I'm not sure. Okay, so we had, um, in the last two weeks, it's so funny, people must be super busy because last week I had like three cancellations last minute and which is fine. One guy said he was bailing hay and he had to do that before it started raining. I 100% understand. So I had a lot of meetings with existing clients um, <clears throat> and I've had a fair share of new client meetings but the majority of them last week were existing clients. Um, but I did have 
One gentleman that had nothing to do with farming. He was a, or he is a realtor and a real estate investor. And so um, that was a fun conversation. He was, you know, he's got several properties. He's got no money in the market. Well, a tiny little bit, but not a whole lot because he doesn't believe in the market. He is a real estate guy. So, um, and then his dad has some real estate that we have to plan. So it doesn't matter if you're farming or not, right? We ha if, if mom and dad have real estate, I had a couple, I had a guy last week and I have a guy this week that even though mom and dad maybe don't farm or you don't farm, in his, in this guy's case, dad ha or mom and dad have real estate. And so what's gonna happen to that real estate when mom and dad pass away? Is he gonna have to buy out a sibling? And does he want it? Is he gonna sell it? Does he want all of it? You know, all that good stuff. And so we still have to talk about that transition and what that transition is gonna look like. And so he is going to want to most likely buy out his sibling I think he just has one brother, yes. And his brother doesn't have anything to do with real estate. He's got um, he's got some app that he developed and so he's going to be extremely um, wealthy if everything continues to go for him. So, but even though, even though you have a sibling that's wealthy, does it mean that that sibling's just gonna say, okay, you can just take that real estate, I don't want it. No, that sibling is most likely going to say, um, no, you need to buy out my share. That sibling may actually say, you know what? No, I want to keep that real estate. Can you just manage it for me? Because I need the tax write-off. You never know what is going to happen. And so um, we talked about that, that his parents are still young enough that life insurance would make sense if he wanted to buy life insurance on them so that he could buy out or at least have a down payment to buy out the brother that is not going to be doing the real estate. Good morning, Marcy. From Washington. This is early for you. All right. Um, Makes sense. Whoa. If he wanted to buy life insurance. On I have to listen to myself on my phone. Okay. The next guy that we talked to, um, this was an interesting conversation, which led to the comments in, or the, the little post that I put today with the title of our um, review. This young man had been in the business, had been in a farming business with his parents. And you guys, sadly, I have several of these situations. And so, what happened is he, mom and dad wanted to get into um, the chicken business. He got into the chicken business with mom and dad, even though others advised him not to do that, which I thought was interesting. He thought it was gonna be okay. It did not turn out okay. And so he was not looking at the books and the books were, money was being spent on business expenses that were not, business expenses. So mom and dad were using that business account for personal reasons and he did not see that. And when he did, you know, of course he confronts them and mom and dad don't want to have responsibility for it. Um, the buyout did not go as planned for separation. It has gotten really, really nasty. <clears throat> The same thing is happening to a couple other clients of mine. And so here's my word of advice. Just because you're doing business with family does not mean you don't need contracts. Does not mean that you don't need to have some sort of formal paperwork that says this is what happens if we split. This is how you're going to pay. And I know that um, Jolene Brown just posted something on her Facebook page about somebody calling her and they had the formal split documents. Everything was all written out while everybody was getting along. And now that they're not getting along, they don't like those documents. Too bad. That's what you agreed on when everything was going okay. And so, 
you don't get to choose at that point what you're gonna what you want that is why those documents are done ahead of time here is another word of advice if you are going into business with mom and dad you don't use the same attorneys make sure that you each have your own attorney because what if the attorney is for one of you and not the other it just the and read the document that their attorney drew up if you're not just I have a client that he's used this he used he didn't even use an attorney he just trusted that mom and dad were gonna do the right thing and there was one little clause in there that says that mom and dad can live on the place till the day they die and it that has that one little clause is turned into an absolute nightmare and there's nothing that they can do to get him off and he did not know that and you know he trusted that mom and dad were going to do the right thing and mom and dad maybe didn't even know it either but the attorney puts it in there so make sure that you have your own attorneys it is this is a business transaction you guys it is not a family farm it's a business transaction and if we want to save the family farm we need to make sure those documents are there. Okay, <clears throat> morning, Jeremy. Hershey, what are you doing in PA? Um, but he has his own business. He's basically starting over. He quit farming because he wants to get out of the hole that he's in. So kudos to him for putting his ego aside and saying, you know what? I need to first get all my finances back together. And he's doing very well financially. Um, I need to get all my finances put back together and get rid of some debt. And really super smart kid, very, very smart kid. Um, but they really have a lot of stuff going on on his side and his wife's side. It's just a, it's just a lot. And family is not always to be trusted. Okay, I have another one that they, interestingly enough, they bought a, you know, they were ranching. Ranching was not going so good. They were from, um, this is, this is fun fact, a little fun fact. They are from Iowa and they bought land in North Dakota. And I don't normally tell you guys where my clients are from, but <laughs> they bought land in North Dakota because it's cheaper. Um, no, we don't have the soils of Iowa. Don't get me wrong, but it's not $25,000 an acre here to buy land either, unless you want to develop it because it's right by town. And then it's not even $25,000 an acre. Iowa's insane. Okay, so they bought a business. <clears throat> um, so they they have a few cows right now, not as many as their land can handle because they bought a business and he is super busy with the business. The business is successful. They've had a few hiccups on that along the way, but once those hiccups get straightened out, they should be 100% totally fine. So it was, um, Again, just like the guy before had to sell all of his stuff to kind of get going, these guys have done the same thing. They've downsized on the cattle side saying, you know what, we just can't, we're not gonna be able to handle all of that and the business. So one has to go. And this is, this, you know, ranching for profit says, take your enterprises and see which one makes money. It doesn't have to be ranching for profit. If you are in a business, which enterprise is actually making you money? Meaning, is it the cattle? Is it the grain? Is it trucking? Is it, you know, whatever it is that you're doing in town? Selling seed, selling fertilizer, selling chemical. Which one of those is making the most money? That we sometimes have to get very, very narrow of what we're going to focus on in order to make that money and to make everything cash flow. Once he gets the business up and running and that all makes sense, then he may want to add some cattle later, right? He might have a hired man, but right now he can rent out the ground. He can, you know, they were kind of struggling with, do we rent out the ground? Do we put it in CRP? What do we do with it? Um, and 
they have to make that decision, whatever is best for them. But right now the decision is we need to run this business because this business is lucrative and we have more money than we had with cattle. So if we have to do that, that's not the end of the world. Okay. All right. And I even put a post on um, TikTok yesterday. Sorry, I have to get back to my comments over here. Um, I even put a post on TikTok yesterday just to help me understand why farmers think that they shouldn't make money and why ranchers think that they shouldn't make money and why they think that that's okay to not make money. And I had somebody post on one uh, or comment on one of my Facebook ads that if we are farming for a profit, that means we're doing it for the wrong reason. If you're not farming for a profit, you're doing it for the wrong reason. We are, it's a business. You need to run it like a business. And I don't know why that scares people. When I tell them that farming is a business and they should be making a profit. I don't understand why that scares people. It should not scare you to make a profit. If I am not making a profit, do you want to do business with me? If a t business in town does not make a profit, do y'all just feel sorry for them or go, geez, they must not know how to run a business. Farming is a business. It doesn't mean that it has to be a big business. It doesn't mean that you have to lose your values. It doesn't mean that you have to lose your lifestyle. It means that you need to run a successful business so you can be there next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. Without knowing our books and running a successful business, we aren't going to be there. And sometimes that's going to mean we have to get rid of the cattle in order to do X, Y, and Z. Um, which I'll just go to the next client that I have in my head. I visited with him yesterday and they're in transition. They are going from a hired man position to leasing some ground, bringing in some cattle, a total transition. We can do term insurance on them, but we cannot do whole life right now. They are not in a position to be able to be paying for whole life insurance. They, I mean, we're talking three, $4,000 a year of whole life premium, and they can't do that because of their situation, but they need life insurance. So we'll do some convertible term. However, he wanted to buy cattle and we were running the numbers. The cattle payment was astronomical. Why not do something on shares? Why not bring some cattle in um, and, and custom graze if you can? You know, he has a neighbor that is super nice, willing to help him out. Great, go that route. We have to sometimes step back and go, we're looking at cows that the bank owns or we're looking at cows that are creating cash flow. And y'all know if you've listened to me any amount of time, I absolutely hate cattle loans. I have no reason to hate them except every single person I know that has them. Every client that I have talked to that has cattle loans is not making a profit. They're either breaking even or going backwards a little bit. Can we custom graze? Can we do shares enough to make a profit and then slowly add to our own herd rather than go buy a hundred head of cattle and have this huge loan? I, I, I just, I never see a profit in those cases. And maybe it's something with the way the operation's being run. I don't know. I just don't like cattle notes. I don't mind a land note, but a land note and a cattle note, oh my God. That's a recipe for disaster. I've seen it over and over and over and over and over. Okay, so that young guy, he has a lot of options. So he needs to take those options. Um, I talked to a, another couple that they, he is a full-time, he AIs, full-time dairy, and then he has a business on the side. Um, they can definitely do something in their situation, but he's just really trying to grow his other business so he can get out of the AI side of things and the state that they live in. Um, they want to leave and y'all probably know what state everybody's leaving, so your guess. Um, but that was a nice conversation because they have one employee for the business. He's on the AI side of things and here's my advice to you. 
they were, they're really looking for somebody to help do their marketing of this business because they want the business to grow. If you are running direct to consumer, if you have just a regular business and you're listening, it does not matter. It is up to you to do some of that Facebook posts, the TikTok posts, the, the shows that you might need to go to, you know, um, farmers markets that you might need to go to, whatever. People don't call me because I've not done anything. I am busy and I am seeing people all the time because I am constantly putting the backside effort in to do these Facebook lives, to post on Facebook. Yes, I have marketing people that help me, but at the end of the day, do you ever see their face on here? No. Do I want to learn technology? Do I want to learn TikTok? No. Am I gonna do trendy crap like dancing on TikTok? No, not happening. My brain does not comprehend fun, right? Like I don't, I don't do stupid shit for fun. I, my brain says we need to be learning 24 seven. And so all the content that I put out is that I don't get onto these trendy things. Be you market yourself. Try to do as much as you can yourself. If you don't like to be in the camera, figure out what other people are doing. And like this guy has a product he sells. He can take a picture of the product. He sews that product. He can take a picture of that. And so it is really, it's, there's a lot of things that can be done outside of you having to talk. Not everybody is comfortable talking to a camera. I am totally okay with that because I could talk to a brick wall and be just fine. (laughs) Not everybody's like that, but get in there where you are comfortable because people don't just go, oh, you know what? I'm going to call her. I've never, I don't even know what she does, but I'm just going to call her. No, that doesn't happen. You guys, and I am such a firm believer in this. I no longer have an office in town. I work out of my home and I, all my assistants are virtual. You can't just come walk into my office and see me. Why? Because nobody did. And when I did have an office, I did not have a business sign. I didn't have a business sign outside my office. People are like, Mary Jo, you want a business sign? Why would I waste money on a business sign? Because people are just going to randomly stop in to talk to somebody about life insurance and finances. No, no. And with my business name, nobody would know anyway, because my business name is not farming without the bank. That's the title of the book, right? In the state of North Dakota, you can't have the word bank in your name unless you are a bank. And so who can stop? Nobody, nobody's gonna stop. So why would I waste money on that? Instead, I will go talk to people. I will do stuff. I will promote myself. Try to do that before we start spending money on other people because we have to, we have to be the face of our own business. Okay. Um, oh, thanks, Marcy. Hey, Paige, the airport in Chicago. I am so sorry for you. (laughs) That does not sound fun at all. All right. I, um, talked to another young couple. Uh, this was fun. They're kind of starting out on their own. Um, they have a lot of stuff going on. They have some rental properties. They have a ranch that they're running with her dad. Um, his mom is a realtor and has lots of investment properties that he wants really nothing to do with when she passes away. And so we had to talk about what is that going to look like? What does that estate look like? Because it's large. And he just doesn't really want to be burdened with it. It's not that he doesn't care. It's just a lot to learn and it's not what he's interested in. And so, but things still, like we still have to kind of know what's going on. So that was a really nice conversation um, and super nice people. She actually sent me an email yesterday and said, um, Mary Jo, I was so nervous to talk to you. You guys, this is just me like this. This is what you get. Yesterday, I started a meeting with, I'm sorry I'm late, I had to go potty. Let's just be real. Like I put my pants on just like everybody else, just because I can push record and I can go live on Facebook does not mean that I am so super important that you should be nervous when you talk to me. 
and I'm not going to yell at you. Some people think I'm going to yell at them because they've invested in 401ks or they did a loan that they maybe don't think they should have done. And they're like, oh, don't yell at me for that. I'm like, well, that's probably not really even a bad idea. So depending on the situation, don't, <laughs> I don't yell at people in my meetings. Um, I am nice to people. So don't be nervous talking to me. But these two, they just don't have a lot of loans. They're very savvy. They just have a lot going on with rental properties and ranching. And she's got a couple other businesses and things that she does. And so they're busy people, but they are in a position too where they need life insurance because they're young people and they need life insurance and they need life insurance on the kids. So I don't remember, <clears throat> I don't remember um, when I did my podcast, but I uh, last, um, I believe it was last week, week before, I found out that I lost a 32 year old client. Um, she passed away. And so she was pregnant. So we, she passed away and they lost the baby as well. And then not even, I don't even think it was three or four days later, I find out that I have another client who had a baby and that little guy is in NICU. And so when you, if you have a policy, um, if you have a policy with me, if you have a policy with somebody else, there are children's writers that can be added to those policies. Do that. Just call your agent. If I'm not your agent, just call your agent and say, can I please add that rider? If you are a client of ours, call us and ask us to add that rider. It is $130 a year. Um, they're normally anywhere between 120 to 140 a year. And typically the coverage is $20,000 of death benefit per child. So that's a total premium of 120 to $140 a year for all your children. Um, and it will cover them. Most companies will cover them if they are born and if they live 15 days or longer, they are then covered. And so just add the rider. Why not have it? Um, it's something that has, you know, even me as an agent, you don't think about it until it happens. And when it happens a lot in a very timely manner, as Nelson would say, you spend a lot of time thinking and praying about it. And so this is something that it is, it, it has made a mark because I just would not have thought about that. Um, but even my client that passed away, she had a son that we had covered and now he is going to have life insurance until he is 22 years old because she's already paid for it. And so it's really an awesome writer that I just did not know it did all those things. I didn't know. They don't tell me that in the pamphlet that they give me. Had I known that, I would have pushed it from the beginning. Um, and then sometimes until you use it, you don't know. And so I, I just normally talk to a lot of young people that have kids or if you're still having kids, just add it. You're spending more money on coffee in a year or beer than what that rider's gonna cost you. Okay. Um, I have another guy that has, he is farming and he is paid by the family farm. He has some of his own stuff. Dad has some of his own stuff. Um, and then there is an uncle that is involved. It's, I can't normally say things are messy, but this is kind of a little bit messy <laughs> because there are corporations set up and dad and the uncle own the corporation and the books aren't super, super clean and he, dad wants to transition and he's supposed to come in and he doesn't necessarily want all parts of the LLCs that they have. And so it's, it's a, it's a bit, um, complicated. It's not even messy really. It's just complicated. And I had a couple of these actually this week that we have LLC set up and then we have all this family within the LLC. So I had another one that almost the exact same scenario, but there were two uncles in the LLC with, no, that was two brothers in the LLC. 
Yeah. I have two brothers in the LLC. Here's my thing with LLCs. They're kind of like cattle notes. I don't love them. Especially when there are partners in LLCs. Because what happens when the partners have kids? Do those kids become members of the LLC upon somebody's death? When, do, when does this LLC end? Who buys who out? It all sounds great and fine and dandy when we have brothers that want to be in an LLC. Makes sense. As long as it's just the brothers in the LLC. Now we have kids that want to farm and we have cousins and, and cousins that aren't farming. And how do we give that all? And who buys who out? And how long does this LLC go? It gets to be crazy. And then when we have so many LLCs, like these guys have a, um, cus they have a trucking LLC that they have carts for, right? Like they, they, they have a trucking LLC and they have a custom harvest that all kind of falls under the L one LLC. But it sounds like, so that LLC goes to the farm fuel tank and gets fuel. So now we're not separating what fuel is going to the custom part of the business and what fuel is going to the farm part of the business. And so everybody just pays for fuel equally. Well, everybody owns everything equally, so it's probably not a big, huge deal. But now when somebody else that isn't equal partners wants to come in, it kind of gets messy. And so if we're going to create all these LLCs, we have to actually keep the records of, you know what, this LL, the truck filled up for harvest. So the truck filled up for custom harvest. Now the truck needs to give that receipt to whoever is filling the tank so that they can be billed correctly and that all the money is being moved around correctly. So LLCs are absolutely fantastic for protection, for legal protection. But are they the best option when we start handing stuff off? And I know I love my friend Jolene Brown. I absolutely love her. And she likes to have LLCs that people can buy a percentage into. And obviously there's a reason that she likes them. Um, but the problem that I have is when people, when families start an LLC and then they think all the non-farm kids should be part of the LLC to make everything fair. Now we've got people in this LLC that don't even know anything about it. So let's say that you and I are in business together and we're selling tires and I don't know crap about tires, but I want, but you know, I should be part of your LLC. You're going to say, no, you don't know anything about the tire business, Mary Jo. I don't want you to be part of the LLC. Well, then why are we doing it for farmers? That doesn't even make sense. So we're doing it for non-farm family. No, they don't get to be part of the LLC. They don't get to make decisions. Nieces and nephews and, and grandkids that don't farm, they don't need to be part of an LLC and they don't even know where the farm's at two or three generations from today. So if we're going to have something like that, why don't we set it up with an end in mind or a transition that it's never going to leave the family farm, okay? Which I have a client that I met with, um, my friend Heidi Olson, is an estate planner and she does trust management. And so we met with um, a potential client that I have and we went over that. And this potential client said, you know what, I, we, nobody gets this farm except the grandchild that wants to farm or grandchildren that want to farm. If there are no grandkids that, if there's only one, that's who gets it, everything. Doesn't matter, the rest of them are not included. And that, in my feelings, that is how that should be because then we don't have input from people that don't know squat and we don't have to buy out people that don't know squat. And if you want those people to have something, then go buy some life insurance and create an estate plan that is correctly done so everybody gets what's fair. It's not gonna be equal. Everybody gets what's fair, okay? Um, Annalise, the writer is, um, Oh, I see what you're saying. It is annually. It's $130 a year. Yes, thank you for asking. And so even Annalise, on that note, um, even if you don't have kids yet, you can add that rider so that any unborn child is going to be covered at day 15. So I don't know if I mentioned that, but you made me think of it. Okay. Let's see. Now, this is the other client that I had this week that they he is in business with brothers. And now the brothers are older and the brothers are retire, kind of retiring, 
right? So the brothers aren't working, but they're still having to collect a paycheck because they're in an LLC and nobody's buying anybody out because we are financially really strapped right now. So we're providing a place for them to live and paying electricity and all these other things, but nobody's actually really making any money. Now this meeting was actually really fun because I like to really get creative and figure out how can we, how can we save land? How can we get out of debt? Like that's that's kind of fun stuff for me even though i don't know if all of it will work i'm i've got lots of ideas and so this couple they were they're in a situation where they have i don't even want to say they have a lot of debt because their debt to their their net worth is far exceeds what their debt is but they are not able to pay some of their past operating so they have a lot of unpaid debt just due to some down years, bad weather, whatever. Um, and about, you know, like he said, they ha they're, they're doing good and then they get hammered and then they basically get out of that and then they get hammered again. And so they're in the, oh, I'm getting out of it stages. And what's fun now is that they have a contract for hogs. So they have guaranteed income coming from this hog contract and they have decided to quit farming because that was what was causing most of the debt and they have rented that land out. So they have two sources of really, and they're in a state where rental income is very high. So they have two sources of really good income. And so they will be okay to kind of break even, but some of this debt, they, they just kind of want to get it paid off because the bank is saying, well, we could, we could refinance all of it into one loan and stretch it out 30 years. I don't like that strategy. Sometimes that's an okay strategy, but when we have bad debt that's been refinanced and now we're going to refinance it again, or maybe refinance it three times, ugh, that's scary to me. So I didn't like that idea, but he is willing to sell some of that farm ground that they're not farming and or all of it. And so if they sell all of it and send somebody to the bank to buy it, guess what? They're going to sell it for this much, but they're going to kind of get that much after taxes. And what they'll get after taxes won't even take care of all the debt that they want to pay off. And so I said, well, could you owner finance it? Could you ask for a big enough down payment that it would, because they don't really, that's worth a lot of money and they don't have a big loan against it. Um, but they have massive capital gains. And so could you ask for a big enough down payment to satisfy three loans that are kind of the problem. Um, one is to release the land. The other two are some back loans that the bank's being very, very nice, but it'd be nice to get them paid off. So could we ask for enough down payment to satisfy three loans and then owner finance the rest? And if we did that, they would have anywhere between 100 to $170,000 land payment coming to them every single year. That along with because they'll have more than the rent they're getting. So that along with the hogs, now we have enough money that we can make all of our payments. We're actually, like they could go do something for the first time in their life because they will actually be turning a profit. Um, and that land is financed, if they finance it over 30 years, it's basically a 30 year pension and they double their money. And he had not thought of that option. He had just thought of the selling option. And so I said, and you don't have to sell all of it. For the price of the land, you don't have to sell all of it. Just sell what you need. Maybe you just need 40 acres. Then just sell the 40 acres um, if that's all that you need to sell. Or 50 acres or 60 acres or 20 acres or whatever. I just frankly don't care. But it's not all or nothing. What are these other strategies? I don't know. If they get enough money to pay that land note off, will the bank release that from collateral or will the bank keep it? Are they going to be able to do it? I don't know, but it's an option. It is the best option for them to explore. Um, they could even do a lease to own. And I talked about that with another client this week. If we're going to be buying from mom and dad, can we do lease to own? What does that look like for long-term care if they have to go into a nursing home? What does that look like for Medicaid? All that good stuff. And so we ha there, there are things that I don't know that you're gonna need to call your attorney and your accountant on, okay? 
but the questions need to be brought up. And in this scenario, if the bank is really that awesome to work with, which I believe that they're great, they've worked with this bank forever and the bank has been awesome, but the bank just recently changed ownership. And so even though our lenders are amazing people, that does not mean that the board is going to allow them to do everything they've always done. So hopefully that is the case. And then these guys can get out of debt. They can have some guaranteed income. Good to go. Worst case scenario, they get the land back. Um, but because they're in transition as well, we kind of need to wait just a hair on, and to see what they're doing. And they frankly just don't have an extra dollar right now to even put into anything. Um, but their child as well wants to take over, but he doesn't want to do any of the farming. He wants to deal with the hogs. And so they're in a situation too, where they've got this LLC with these brothers and what does that look like? And what do this other nieces and nephews want to do? And I don't like LLCs. It's just that simple. And maybe I make them harder than they need to be. Um, you're welcome, Annalise. Good morning, Bruce. All right, what do we got here? Oh, I already told you about this guy. Um, then I have a guy that was, um, he is farming. He's farming on his own, but he's also farming with dad and he gets a paycheck from dad every month but his family transition stuff is gonna be kind of messy as well. Cause he has a stepmother and he has step siblings involved and um, a brother that is not even living locally. And then they've got grandma stuff and grandma's actually passing it down to skip a generation. And so this guy is doing great financially. He's upside right cause he's paying attention to everything but trying to prepare him for the estate side of things. Um, when we looked at the numbers, it actually didn't make sense to buy something on mom and dad when he could have just bought it on his own. Now he had an existing, pol he had, well, he has an existing policy already and he has that policy with Ohio National. And Ohio National was a mutual company. They demutualized last year. They have bought everybody out. They are now privately owned, going to most likely be a stock company. And so he wants to move that policy someplace else. The agent that he has that policy with does know infinite banking. They are not infinite banking practitioners and certified, but they do know infinite banking. Um, here's his thing. He said they understand it and they're very, very nice people, but they don't understand farming. And so at the end of the day, I am not a person that is going to take business from somebody else. Um, if it, it, it happens that people want to come over in a situation like this, people want to come over. They want to, they want to do business with somebody that understands farming and ranching. And he said, I have no hard feelings over there. They're very nice people, but I do not mesh with them on a personal level and, and, you know, obviously we had a very great conversation because <laughs> we're, we think a lot alike and he liked that. And I understand farming and ranching, which is, which is what he's doing. And the policy that he had did not have the flexibility and payment that farmers and ranchers need. So a lot of people say, well, Mary Jo, why do you do business with One America? Why don't you write business with most other companies? Because most other companies do not have the flexibility and premium payment that One America offers their clients. And they, th that is of utmost importance because you know, as farmers and ranchers, that you could have five good years and you could have 15 really bad years. There is not a profit, a built-in profit margin. We don't know what grain prices are going to be. We don't know what cattle prices are going to be. We do not know what is going on. I mean, COVID actually helped a lot of ranchers that to go farm to table, right? But that is not always, like, we don't know. We have no idea. And so years and years before that, those people struggled. So it is important to have a company and to have an agent that understands. 
I have inherited other clients that I knew the agent, super, super great people. And those clients came to me and their policy premiums were astronomically high because the policy was written in 2012, 2013, when cattle prices were $3,000 a bred heifer. I mean, that's insane. Anybody in the cattle industry knows that that price is not going to hold. If you've been in the cattle industry for more than a day, you should know that that price is not gonna hold. But if we have an agent that does not understand the industry, we're going to have something that works if we can pay the premium, but we may not have a premium that is set correctly. We may not have a premium written that is flexible. And so here's another thing um, that this gentleman was told and he said, well, I only had one more year to pay full premium. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, well, I was in year five. So I, I pay premium for five years and then it drops down to the death benefit only. Okay, that is a strategy that people in this industry used years ago. And math has proved that to be wrong. And so I'm gonna be bold here and I'm gonna probably piss off some colleagues. But if you are writing a policy and you are only putting premium in, full premium for four years, and then we are dropping it down and starting new policies, that is because an agent wants to make commission. There is no, I am not gonna mince words, that is complete BS. And so he had this mindset that, oh, well, I, I just wanna, I wanna just pay minimum premium. Well, are you building a bank? Because if you're building a bank, you don't wanna pay minimum premium. And then he's like, well, I can stop paying premium, right? No, you can't stop paying premium. So he thought that as soon as the policy becomes a modified endowment contract, that premium ends. Premium doesn't end. Ideally, you wanna pay premium until the day you die. And I actually calculated the numbers for him and I don't remember what they were off the top of my head, but in the first 30 years, he made about $40,000 of cash value. And in the last 20 years, he made like 170,000 or something of increase in cash value. The last 20 years are massive. When Nelson told us to think long term, that's what he was talking about. Think long term. Because the first 20, the first 30 years, this policy looks like it's a mediocre, right? But when you are talking to somebody that is 40, 50 years old, we've got a lot of years to live. So the first 20 to 30 years, yeah, we're okay. The last 20 to 30 years are astronomically huge in compounding and we're not even putting in that much premium. So do I want you to stop paying premium when we are starting to feed the beast? No, absolutely not. And this is how I compare it. It's like saying, you know what? I have this, I bought this really good cow, man. She has thrown some really nice calves, right? But I'm gonna sell her because it's been three years. So I'm getting rid of her. No, you don't sell that cow, you flush her. You get as many embryos out of her as you possibly can because she is producing nice calves. We don't start over when something is working. We do, it's the same thing with the policy. That sucker just got going and now we wanna start over? I mean, that is, in my opinion, run the numbers and this, some agents know the answer to this question. They've seen the numbers and they are ignoring them because they want their checkbook to be bigger at your expense. Oh, makes me mad. I don't want you to start another policy until you need to start another policy. And speaking of starting another policy, I have a client that, and this is this was today's podcast. So I'm gonna reiterate it again, if you already listened to the podcast. But I have a client that called and said, Mary Jo, you know what? I don't want 75% of my money to go to cash value. Because what happens is when I set a policy up, and you guys see it in the book, when I set a policy up that 75% of your money goes to cash value, that means that we're only gonna be able to pay full premium 10, 15, maybe 20 years, and then that thing is gonna mech, and then we have to reduce premium. He doesn't ever want to reduce premium. He wants to pay full premium the rest of his life. <laughs> Kudos to him, because that is a very beautiful structured policy, okay? 
beautiful. So he's not so much worried about death benefit. He doesn't worry. He's not worried about cash value year one. He is saying, Hey, I don't want to start new policies every 10 to 15 years. I want to be able to put money in this thing forever. And what is awesome about that is he is going to have a farm and he is going to be able to sell that farm. Even I don't care if it's his kid, not his kid, whatever. He is going to have income coming in the rest of his life from the sale of his farm, right? Or if he decides to farm the rest of his life, he will have income coming in. Where is he going to put that income if he is uninsurable, if he can't get insurance? And he doesn't want to manage 49 policies. He said, that's awesome. Nelson has 49 policies, but I don't want to, when I take a loan, I don't want to take a loan from 10 policies. I want to take a loan from two or three, right? Or one, better yet. So he, he wanted a premium that was split 50-50 so that we don't mech that thing. We go the entire life of the insured and we do not mech that policy. Oh, it was very refreshing. And here's the thing. He listens to the podcast. He's reading the books. He is educating, educating, educating himself. It is so fun to have conversations with those clients of mine that do that because I can just see the wheels spinning, right? Nothing is free in the insurance industry. I'm either going to give you your money up front or we're going to get it later. Nothing is free. And so I actually ran it for him. A 50-50 split versus 50-50 um, versus 60-40, I think it was. Whatever. They all, at year 90, they balanced out. Both policies, no, 75-25, the way I usually do it for farmers. So I looked at them. Guess what? At the end of the day, at 90, 95 years old, the cash value and the death benefit was exactly the same. Nothing's free in the in insurance world. You're either going to get it up front or you're going to get it later. But do we want a place to warehouse money? You know, Nelson wrote two books. His second book is Warehouse of Wealth. Do we want a place to warehouse our wealth? And that is what he is talking about. Why do we want to stop paying premium? We should have a place to put money. We are going to need a place to put money. So, if we can give up access to a little bit of money today, if we can give up access to, to 40 or 50% of our money today to have it later, and here's the other funny thing, instead of breaking even at year 10, he broke even at like year 13 or 14. It's just another three years. And when we're talking about three years, we're not talking about a ton of, a ton of loss. We're talking about a little bit of money over those three years that it probably isn't even going to matter. He's not going to, he's not going to even notice a thousand bucks, right? The other thing that this guy said to me yesterday when I was visiting with him is, and, and he said, he said it, but every, almost every client says it. Well, I'm not going to have the money to pay that premium. Well, let's just say it's $5,000. $5,000 today sounds like a lot of money. $5,000 in 35 years from now is going to be pocket change, you guys, with inflation the way it is. It is not going to feel like $5,000. And so we have to think about inflation and what that feels like. Remember, Nelson in Warehouse of Wealth, he actually has checks, um, dividends, and he tells you what his premium was on his state farm policy. Um, I want to say it was like $688. I forget off the top of my head or 388 or something. It was absolutely peanuts, but that was a lot of money when Nelson wrote that policy because of inflation. It does not feel like that what it does today. So even a 20 year old, you know, we can look at a 20 year old's cash value and be like, oh my gosh, you're going to have $2 million of cash value. And they think that's a lot of money. And then I'm realistic, right? I'm like, you guys, that is a lot today, but that's going to actually be absolute peanuts in 30 or 40 years from now. That's not going to get you anywhere. So keep in mind that this is one of many policies that need to be started because we, if we're trying to save ourselves into retirement, we're not going to be able to. And I've said this over and over and over and over again. And I am like the broken record. We need cash flow. We need to create the cash flow because of it. inflation is killing us so quickly that we're that savings is a joke, an absolute joke. We have got to start buying things, creating businesses, doing things that are going to create cash flow. 
If you have not listened to my podcast with the demographer on there, you probably need to go listen. I don't remember what le- which one it was. It was just back probably six, seven episodes, something like that. Okay. Um, let me, I am about done. Um, I'm just going to see what I talked to clients about this week. Um, I talked to another client that bought some cattle as a tax write-off and built some buildings so that she can depreciate those buildings. Okay. Here's the deal. You do not need to have cows to depreciate a building. You can, she can have cold storage and she can still depreciate that building. All she needs is a business to be able to depreciate that building. Um, and when I told her how the buying things to have a tax write off works, she had no idea that, okay, let's say you're in a 20% tax bracket. You spend a hundred thousand dollars to save 20 or you spend a hundred thousand to save 20,000. Where'd the other 80 go? Gone. Poof. Spending cash, right? Because we built said building or we bought said tractor, whatever it is that we're doing. And so when accountants don't explain that, that is super frustrating to me because my accountant didn't, I shouldn't say that. I had an accountant that explained it to me after I did it because I was just doing what my parents always did, which is you buy things to avoid taxes, right? Well, now I have payments and the payments are stressful. In her case, there weren't any payments. It was a bunch of cash gone, but now we don't have liquidity of money. We have no cash because we put it in a building that we really didn't need. Just pay the damn taxes. I don't like to pay them either, but sometimes you just pay the taxes because it is smarter to pay the taxes than to create the debt and the cash flow leaving our system all the time. And so, you know, it, it was a struggle between, well, maybe if I keep, um, maybe if I keep these cattle, I'll make five grand next year. And then I'll actually make some money or you could not, you don't love them. They're there for a, just as a tax write off. So cattle prices are fairly decent right now. So could we sell them, make the money and then just turn it into a storage unit? I mean, she's close enough to a city that it could be a storage unit, but here's the other thing she said is Mary Jo, I'm going to have to sell the place if I, I'm going to have to sell the place if I sell the cows. I said, but the cows weren't making money anyway. So your off the farm job is what was paying for the place to begin with. This place was not making any money to help you pay for it. So why would you have to sell it? And you're not going to have the expenses of the cattle. So now you'll actually have some liquid cash. And so we sometimes, and, and she is a very, very smart individual. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the emotional side of it and we get so worried that we put blinders on and we just can't think because we're frozen, right? It is a proven fact that we cannot think positive if we are thinking negative. Proven fact, can't do it. And so if we can get out of that negative space and that scarcity mindset and open to abundance, and sometimes we have to surround ourselves with people that have that abundance mindset that can think of those solutions. Doesn't mean every, every idea is gonna work, but it gets our mind going again because we're stuck. We're just stuck and we can't, we can't get out of that until we have some help sometimes. And so calling for help is key, right? And maybe making that call to me a year ago or two years ago would have been a better bet than making that call today and getting some of that guidance because we just want to avoid taxes. It was a great lesson. It was not a bad thing that happened. Everything is good, but we have to run the numbers. And this morning I was listening. Um, I just recently met Steve Chater, who is a, one of the top real estate agents for Keller Williams in the country. Um, amazing, amazing guy that knows a lot about real estate. And he wrote the book Hold. And he was talking in that book that if you cannot buy rental properties, if the numbers don't make sense, you have to get your emotions out of it. And farming and ranching and every business is the exact same way. I mean, there have been businesses that I have wanted to start because in my head, it sounded so good and so fun. And when you put the numbers on paper, you cannot deny that it is a losing venture. And it just does not make sense to do it. There are things even within, 
farming without the bank and without the bank that I would absolutely love to do. But sometimes it just financially does not make sense to do that, right? And I've done stuff without running the numbers and <laughs> paid the piper. Um, so I've learned along the way that the numbers have to make sense and not running those numbers and just doing stuff blindly or doing stuff because mom and dad did stuff does not always make sense because that doesn't mean that mom and dad did it correctly. Right, Marcy? Oh my gosh. I could have talked to him forever. He cut me off. I could have gone on and on and on and on and on. And he gave me an hour and I'm super happy for that hour. But if you like his stuff, Marcy, you can listen to him. He is on, he has a ton of interviews on podcasts. Um, and yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> he's awesome. And he repeats a lot of the same stuff. And he's very up here and sometimes you have to get a little bit deeper. But nonetheless, very eye-opening and oh my gosh, the opportunities in this country are endless after you listen to that episode. If you are telling me that there is not a business that needs to be started and people that need to be helped and things that need to be done, you maybe are not fit to be a business owner. And that is not a bad thing. That is not a bad thing. Not I. We need employees. I need employees. Um, we need lots of employees. Not everybody is meant to be a business owner, but there are so many opportunities coming up and I just want to take them all. Uh, I, I also just read the book, Who Not How, written by Dan Sullivan and somebody else. Uh, I forget his name. He's got a PhD or something. Um, that book is really, really good too. And one of my colleagues, um, Jason Lowe out of Canada, keeps talking about it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And then I read it and I didn't know. And so it is awesome. Um, Annalise, if you are still listening, that book is um, awesome. You guys, you and George need to read that, but, or listen to it. I bought it on audio, who not how, and I will listen to it again and I will take notes this time. Okay. Um, had another a call with a client that just said, Hey, Mary Jo, we've got some extra money from some timber. And so should we be paying off loans? Should we pay premium? Do we start another policy? What do we do with it? And stuff like that, like it's enough money to make a loan payment. It's enough money to make their current premium payment, but it is not enough money to start new policies. And so we're not starting new policies. We're just going to pay back existing loans or we're just going to use it to pay premium. Um, but, I mean, we're, it, it just was not enough to start a new policy. So there's no reason to saddle somebody with premium when they can already fit that premium in their existing policies. So um, again, that's why I'm here for my clients is to make sure that you guys call and we have those conversations. Here's the other fun part about the conversation that we had with them is that um, I learned that campers are cheaper here in North Dakota than they are down South. And after I talked to them, I talked to another client that lives in the South and same thing. Campers are, um, well, the other person is actually in California. So one's in Arkansas, one's in California. And I can't believe how expensive campers are down there. We do not, campers are sitting up here and basically not even selling. Um, we actually pulled them up when we were talking and they're like $5,000 cheaper here than they are down there. Granted, you have to get it down there. Um, but they're sitting on the, they're sitting on ads for sale for 20 to 30 days here where there, that camper would have been gone immediately. So I'm like, maybe you guys need to come up here and grab a couple of them and sell them. I don't know. That's, that's crazy. Okay. Um, that's all I got today, guys. Let me see. Let me check one last thing. Yeah, I had a lot of new clients this week. A lot of existing clients last week. Okay, let me know if you guys have questions on anything if you need anything if you want to hear something on a podcast whatever um message me here happy to help otherwise have a great fourth of july 
And let me see whose birthday was it again? Brent. Happy birthday, Brent. Talk to you guys next, oh, two weeks. Have a good one.